In this video, we begin chapter five, thermochemistry, which might sound familiar, might not. Right, chances are you've heard of the word thermodynamics. Okay? And if you continue on into chem two, we'll spend another chapter talking about thermodynamics in general. Here we're looking at thermochemistry, which you could kind of consider it to be a branch of thermodynamics, right? in that it's just the thermodynamic principles that directly relate to some things that we see in general chemistry this semester. Yep. There are three subchapters here, 5.1 energy basics, which we'll cover in this video, 5.2 calorimetry, and then 5.3 enthalpy, which will be broken into two sections for a total of four videos from chapter five. So what is thermochemistry all about? Thus far, we've been thinking about reactions that occur Right? And we've been looking at how atoms and molecules move around, but we haven't been thinking about energy. And you know from your day-to-day -day life that a lot of chemical reactions have energy associated with them, as shown with the match here, or right, the gas in the internal combustion that gets your car from point A to point B. So chapter five is where we start to consider right, the chemical changes and the accompanying change in energy, because that has a huge play into our everyday world in many fields, right, such as biology or engineering. So the definition of thermochemistry is the study of the heat, and we'll see how that relates to energy, absorbed or released during a chemical or a physical change. And to expand on that definition, we need to have two key ideas. So I recommend you write down these definitions as we go throughout. Thermochemistry, you just need to know in general, right? I won't ask you to memorize that definition, but this one you should know, these two rather, energy and work. Okay. Energy is the capacity to supply heat or do work. So now we see how the word heat relates to the word energy. Okay. And you can think about energy as causing matter to move against an opposing force, like friction or inflating a tire, right? If you're working a pump to inflate a tire, that's working against the pressure, the opposing force. Work is the process of causing matter to move against an opposing force. So there we see how work ties into energy. And there are two types of energy. Okay? You've probably heard of these before as well, but if not, here are their definitions. Potential energy and kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is the one that students tend to be more familiar with, like the energy that an object possesses because of its motion. So when your car is traveling down the highway, it has a lot of kinetic energy. Potential energy, the energy that an object has because of its relative position or its composition or condition, which tend to relate to chemistry, the composition and condition, right? Things can be high energy prone to explosion, for example. But even a relative position can give something more potential energy. If you think about an object that's kind of teetering on an edge, right? That has a lot of potential energy, it's prone to falling. Or water at the top of a waterfall has a lot of potential energy because it has the potential to fall down. And then as it falls down the waterfall, it has a lot of kinetic energy, something that we can harness for power, such as in the image to the right, showing the Hoover Dam. Yeah. So that gives us another law for Gen Chem 1. We had the law of conservation of matter before, and this is somewhat similar, law of conservation of energy, which tells us during a chemical or a physical change, energy can't be created or destroyed but it can change form. Just like an atom can join a molecule, energy can change form between kinetic or potential, right? but it can't just disappear or spontaneously be created. And when substances are converted and we're undergoing a chemical reaction, there's always some sort of conversion of energy into a different form, right? We see heat light, electricity, all involved in chemical reactions. So here's another type of energy, okay? really a subset of kinetic energy, and that's thermal energy. And if we're thinking about heat in chapter five, thermal energy is really important. Okay? So thermal energy is a type of kinetic energy that's associated with the random motion of atoms and molecules. And unless you are at zero Kelvin, which is absolute zero, okay, your atoms and molecules are always moving to some extent. 
even at the desk you're sitting at right now, which is a solid, right? The atoms and molecules that make up that desk are vibrating a little bit at the atomic scale. And that's because everything, unless it's at absolute zero, has thermal energy, the random motion of atoms and molecules. And that relates to temperature. Because if there's no physical change, changing the thermal energy changes the temperature. Higher thermal energy is higher temperature. As we'll see later on, physical changes can play with that definition a little bit. What temperature is, is just a quantitative measurement of hot or cold. Right. So if I'm considering something to be hot, that means it has a high thermal energy. That means those molecules and atoms are vibrating and moving around randomly faster. And if you flip around all of those definitions, slower moving molecules mean you have a low thermal energy, things feel cool. Right. So as the temperature of something increases, right, that's our quantitative measurement, that means the thermal energy is increasing. The molecules are moving faster that object is getting hotter. So we can see that thermal energy, temperature, and kinetic energy all correlate with one another. And we can maybe see that in the picture here. If you're more of a visual learner, right? We think about hot water and cold water. You see that the hot water has more thermal energy. These things are vibrating to a greater degree. And we use that same process to think about heat. Okay. Heat is the transfer of thermal energy between two objects, two bodies here at different temperatures. And it's a spontaneous process. Okay. Heat flow, which is that transfer of thermal energy, it increases the thermal energy of whatever was colder, right? whatever had a lower thermal energy. And it decreases the thermal energy of whatever was hotter, what had more thermal energy. So heat spontaneously flows from the thing of high thermal energy, high temperature, to the thing with low thermal energy that has low temperature, as long as they're in contact with one another. And that continues until both of the substances are at the same temperature. And it's a spontaneous process, right? It happens without any input. And you've seen that if you put ice into a drink. If you're trying to cool down a drink, you put ice into your drink. So you're making an iced tea, right? put ice into the tea and it cools it down. But it's not that the ice is giving cold to the drink, right? It's taking away the hot, the thermal energy. Thermal energy is transferring from the warmer tea into the ice cube until the ice cubes melt. And eventually call it an hour later, maybe more if it's well insulated, right? It gets to where all the ice is melted and everything's at the same temperature. It's a spontaneous process. Again, we can see that visually. We've got something that's hot, high thermal energy, something that's cold, low thermal energy. Put them in contact with one another and thermal energy goes from hot to cold, right? High temperature to low temperature, high thermal energy to low thermal energy until they are at the same temperature, which we call thermal equilibrium. Okay. So those are important ideas so far. Okay. Heat, work, energy, kinetic energy, potential energy, thermal energy. And here we have two of the most important definitions from chapter five, okay? endothermic and exothermic processes. You have to know these terms from chapter five because when matter undergoes a chemical or a physical change, it can either release heat or absorb heat at the end of the day after the reaction is finished. And a change that net releases heat is called exothermic. Any combustion reaction is an exothermic reaction, right? If something's combusting, you know it feels hot. That's because it's releasing heat. Okay. If you sit by a fire, right, it feels warm because that fire, that combustion is exothermic. It's releasing heat and you're feeling that heat that's released. Okay. Flip side of that, something that absorbs heat is called an endothermic process. So a chemical cold pack, right? you start the reaction, it feels cold, it's endothermic. It's absorbing heat. So when it feels cold to you because it's taking the heat away from your body. So we need units to describe these things, okay? Traditionally, energy was measured in units of a calorie 
which is abbreviated as CAL. Different from the calorie you see associated with food, okay? you'll notice on the side, right, if you're looking at nutrition facts, that's calorie with a capital C is actually a thousand of these calories, okay? See, kilocalorie. And the original definition of that calorie was the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. Okay. But the problem is if you have a changing pressure and a changing starting temperature, that can actually vary a little bit. So the SI unit that we have for heat work and energy is joule, okay. abbreviated with the letter J. Okay, so symbol J represents joule. And that's defined as the amount of energy used when a force of one Newton moves an object one meter, named after this guy, James Prescott Joule. And if you've taken physics and worked with this in the past, right, it's also equal to one kilogram meter squared per second squared or one Newton meter. Okay? Gives us some ability to work with the units there. And it ties into the calorie, right? One calorie is equal to 4.184 joules. And with that in mind, it allows us to do some calculations. Okay, so you don't have to know the calorie, you do need to know the joule in this chapter. Okay, for my class anyway. So two things that we can use the joule to describe, heat capacity and then specific heat capacity, looking at 16 and 17, and these are different quantities. So note the difference, heat capacity and then specific heat capacity next. Heat capacity is represented by a capital C. Okay. And that is the quantity of heat that something absorbs or releases when it experiences a temperature change of one degree Celsius. Okay. And you'll notice on these slides it says, or one Kelvin, because remember from chapter one, Celsius and Kelvin have the same scale. Every change in one degree Celsius is a change in one Kelvin. And the heat capacity, right, C is equal to Q, the heat over the change in temperature, delta T. Remember, delta represents change and T Right, temperature. Heat capacity is an extensive property. So that means you might recall that definition as well from chapter one. It depends on the amount of matter present. Okay. So the more matter present, the larger something is, right, the higher heat capacity it will have. That's what the last bullet point is talking about. Heat capacity of a large cast iron pan is greater than that of a small pan. And that's why in chemistry, we frequently use what's called specific heat capacity. Right? So what's the difference between the previous slide and this one on slide 17? Well, notice it's a lowercase c, right? Specific heat capacity, lowercase c. And then we've got this m over here. Okay? Because the specific heat capacity of something, and specific, we're usually just calling it specific heat. You'll hear me refer to that in the later videos. Right? it's the quantity of heat that's required to raise the temperature of exactly one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius or one Kelvin. So we introduce that M in here and that has taken what was previously an extensive property to now make it an intensive property. So it doesn't depend on the amount present, only the material itself, its identity. So the specific heat capacity of things are the same as long as they're made out of the same material. So if we look at two pans here, the larger pan is going to have a higher heat capacity than the smaller pan because heat capacity is extensive. But specific heat is intensive. So because these two pans are both cast iron, they have the same specific heat capacity. But specific heat is something that varies, right? Everything has a different value of specific heat. Okay? So cast iron would have a higher specific heat than something like aluminum foil. Okay? Aluminum foil loses its temperature very quickly, which is why if you're working in the oven, you can frequently grab aluminum foil just with your fingers. Right? But you would never go in and grab a hot cast iron pan with your hand. You'd use an oven mitt. Okay? So this table 5.1 from your textbook gives you specific heat values for some common substances. Right? And this is something that would always be provided to you on a test or a quiz or a homework, right? This is the one we'll use most often. We'll see why in 5.2 for calorimetry. 
if its specific heat of liquid water is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. We use specific heat to calculate heat. Okay? So specific heat is C. It appears in this calculation right here. And we use that in heat calculations. Heat is represented by Q. Okay? And using this formula here, Q equals CM delta T, it allows us to calculate a lot of information. If I know heat or mass or temperature change, right, provided with a heat transfer, I can calculate any one of these variables. Okay. So remember, delta T is temperature change, which means it's the final temperature minus the initial temperature. You take that value, multiply it by the mass of the object, multiplied by the specific heat, that's equal to the heat value overall. If something has gained thermal energy in a process, that means its final temperature is higher. That's gonna make the value of Q positive overall because masses are always positive, specific heat values are always positive. And so if this is positive, then Q is positive overall. If something has lost thermal energy and has cooled over a process, right? That means TF, T final here is less than the initial temperature. That makes this negative, Again, these are both positive, so Q will be negative overall. So you should be familiar with that as well. If Q is positive, something is heated up. If Q is negative, something has cooled down. Okay. So remember this formula and know how everything ties together. So the way I remember it, right, is Q equals MC delta T. You've got Q, which is your heat. That has units of joules. So I'll switch to drawing it here. So that has a unit of joules equals our mass, which has always got to be in grams. Keep that in mind. Your C, if you go back and look at the units for little c over there, specific heat, it's joules over gram multiplied by degree Celsius. And then your delta T is final minus initial. And that final unit should be degree Celsius. So you notice when you multiply everything together, grams on the top, grams on the bottom, degree Celsius on the bottom, degree Celsius on the top, joules should be your unit. So keep that in mind when you're doing these calculations, right? Heat in joules, mass in grams, Specific heat is joules per gram degree Celsius. Temperature change should be in degrees Celsius. That allows you to do calculations like what we have on the next slide. Okay. Tells us we have a flask that contains 800 grams of water. We heat it, temperature of the water increased from 21 to 85 degrees Celsius. Okay, so that tells me because the temperature increased, I know Q should be positive. But the question is, how much heat did the water absorb? Okay. So I use that formula, Q equals MC delta T. Right. I have my mass in grams. I calculate my temperature change here, right? 85 minus 21, so 64 degrees Celsius. I use my specific heat, multiply those three together, and you end up with 210,000 joules, 2.1 times 10 to the fifth. It's also common to see things in chapter five represented in kilojoules, right? And that's just the kilo prefix, right? So one kilojoule is equal to 1000 joules. Okay, so we could have also represented this answer as 210 kilojoules. Okay, so don't let that freak you out if you see that in your sapling. Right, but know how to do these calculations. We're going to continue these same ideas in the next video for 5.2 calorimetry. Right? That is probably the most important formula from chapter five, Q equals MC delta T. So make sure you know what that means, how to use it, as well as the various definitions that were introduced in this video for 5.1.